Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. I apologize for the delay there. I think my internet connection went down, so I hope that you can hear me and you can see me. And apologies for the delay, but thank you for joining. We continue our series, Mark's Message. We're thinking of the uh, great message of the Gospel by Mark and finding that in each chapter, Mark has a slightly different message for us. It's the same message, but just from a different angle. And tonight we come to chapter five. Now, chapter five is a wonderful chapter in this gospel. There are so many incidents in it. It's difficult to choose, but we're going to think of perhaps my favorite miracle recorded in the gospels tonight as we read in Mark chapter five. So I'd like to read in Mark chapter five and beginning uh, at verse 25. Mark five, verse 25. Now, a certain woman had an issue of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she knew in her body that she was healed of that affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Amen. Now, this is actually a miracle within a miracle because the Lord Jesus in this chapter was on his way to perform a great miracle. He was about to raise a 12 year old girl from the dead, and he was en route. Uh, to where the girl lay. He was on his way. He really started to deal with this very serious case. A girl had just died. But as he is going along, we read it together, as he's going along to deal with this uh, very serious case, suddenly this lady appears and she almost interrupts the Lord Jesus. And it's as though she sees her opportunity as the Lord Jesus is there present. And although he's involved in going to bless somebody else, she sees that she's got an opportunity to be blessed. And she doesn't just see her opportunity, she seizes it. And so it's a miracle within a miracle. And the Lord Jesus is on his way to bless somebody else, but while he's on his way, she thinks to herself, well, why can't I get blessing too at the same time? Dear friends, this is a wonderful thing, and it tells me this, the Lord Jesus is still blessing people, and perhaps somewhere tonight in the world, people will be saved, and they will turn to the Lord Jesus, and he will bless them, and he will save them. Well, while he's blessing them, why can't he bless you as well? Why can't you be blessed? And so you can be like this woman and take the opportunity that while the Lord Jesus is on his way to perform other miracles, to bless other people, he can bless you as well. And that's exactly what happened to this dear lady. And all it took was just one touch. Now, I want to make it very clear, and I'm sure you appreciate this. It wasn't somehow that the Lord Jesus had magic clothes that if he touched his clothes, then there was some power that went out from him. And it wasn't that if you just physically touched the Lord Jesus while he was here, that somehow that automatically meant blessing for you. Uh, you'll notice the Lord Jesus in this incident, he didn't say to the lady, your touch has saved you. He said, your faith has saved you. And when this lady reached her hand out and touched the Lord Jesus, touched the border of his garment, that action was an expression of her faith in Christ. Dear friends, we must make this very clear. It is always faith in the Lord Jesus that brings blessing. It's always faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that brings salvation. And so here she is. And just one touch but that touch, that act, was really the evidence. It was the expression of her trust, of her faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so tonight, I want briefly just to mention four things about this faith that is expressed in just one touch, the touch of this lady as she reaches out and touches the Lord Jesus. Of course, we read about her case just very briefly. It was a, a long-standing case. It was an internal problem. Basically, her life, the life is in the blood, and her life was draining away from her, and she tried everything. She had consulted every doctor. She had spent all her living, and instead of making it better, the treatment she'd received actually exacerbated the situation and made it worse, and she was deteriorating, and she was beyond the help of man. But I want to think about this lady, that in her touch, she is expressing four things, really, about her faith in Christ. First of all, it was a reasonable faith. You see, Mark tells us that she reasoned in her mind before she ever touched the Lord Jesus. She thought this thing through, and she came to a conclusion, which was a very, very sound conclusion. And we read about it, that she said uh, in, her, in her mind, in her heart, uh, she said, if I could just touch him, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. She came to this conclusion that if she could get close enough to the Lord Jesus, if she could make contact with him, then she would be saved. She would be blessed. She came to that conclusion through reason, because the Bible tells us that she'd heard about the Lord Jesus. We read that together. She'd heard about Jesus, and she reasons like this. Well, if he can raise the dead, if he can calm the storms, if he can cast out demons, if he can make the blind to see, if he can make the lame to walk, if he can make deaf people to hear, then surely he can deal with me as well. Nobody else has been blessed like this before, but it doesn't put this lady off because she has good sound reasoning on her side. If he can do that, then he can do this. If he can bless these people, then he can bless me. If he can save them, if he's got the power to save them, well, he's got the power to save me as well. Dear friends, this is wonderful. You know, sometimes people talk about blind faith, but blind faith is not really blind at all. God is asking you to do a very reasonable thing in trusting his son, because the Lord Jesus has already saved millions of people. He's blessed them. He's given them new life. He's given them forgiveness. And because he died on the cross to pay the price for our salvation and rose from the dead, the Bible says he's able to save all who come to God by him. And so it's just a reasonable, logical thing to think, well, if he saved them, then he can save me. You know, the Apostle Paul, he made the same argument. He describes himself as the worst sinner, the chief of sinners. And he basically argues and says, well, if he can save me, that means he can save anybody else. And so this woman has logic. She has reason on her side. And she thinks, it's no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he can do for me. And there is a good, reasonable expectation that if she comes to the Lord Jesus and is able to make contact with him, then what he did for them he can do for her as well. Dear friends, perhaps I'm talking to somebody tonight, and you know Christians, and you know the power of God in their lives. You know that the lives have been changed, and you know that people have been converted. They've been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been blessed. They've been given peace and forgiveness and eternal life. What he has done for others, he can do for you as well. And so this was faith, reasoning, and coming to the conclusion, if only I can get in contact with him, then if he blessed other people, and if he's got the power to do it, then he's got the power to bless me and to save me. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that you could be saved? Do you believe that you could be forgiven? Do you believe you could be born again? Do you believe that you could be sure of being in heaven? You can be absolutely certain on a reasonable, logical basis because he saved other people, and so he can save you as well. But then secondly, not only was it a reasonable faith, it was a personal faith. We, we discover the Lord, the Lord Jesus is moving along, and he is, he's thronged. There's a, there's a crowd round about him. He's surrounded by a mass of people. But this lady, as she comes to him, she's not depending on some kind of group faith or some kind of block faith or, or corporate faith. She has a personal faith 
The Lord Jesus didn't say to him, um, uh, your nation's faith or your family's faith or your husband's faith or your friend's faith has saved you. He said, your faith has saved you. It was a personal faith. And because she had a personal need that was unique to her, she needed a personal savior and she needed to personally put her faith and trust in him. Dear friends, again, maybe somebody's listening to this and there are friends and there are relatives and they're Christians and they're believers in the Lord Jesus. And perhaps you think that because that is the case that somehow you're included as well. Dear friend, you need to have a personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need not only to have a reasonable faith that you believe that he can do it for you, but you have to have a personal faith. So the Lord Jesus says, your faith, not someone else's faith, not the church's faith, not the synagogue's faith, not the rabbi's faith, your faith has saved you. And so it was a reasonable faith. It was a personal faith. Thirdly, it was an act of faith. You know, we read that she heard about the Lord Jesus, but that was not enough. And then it's evident, as we've just been thinking, she believed that the Lord Jesus could do it. She, she reasoned that out in her mind. That still wasn't enough. She realized that if she was to get the blessing, she had to take action. It wasn't enough just to believe that, well, yes, I, I, the story is true, what I've heard, and I believe he could do it. I believe he could save me. She had to take action definite action. And I can see her making her way to the Lord Jesus. We, we discover she's part of a crowd that has been waiting for the Lord Jesus. He was across at the other side of the sea. And I can imagine all these people are, are standing on the seashore, straining just to get a glimpse of the boat that's coming across, carrying the Lord Jesus. And in the crowd, that woman is there and she's determined. She's going to take action. She's going to do something. And as the crowd go away, as, as they move along and the Lord Jesus is in the middle, she joins the crowd and she, she works her way in. She works her way in behind the Lord Jesus till she gets close enough and she gets down and the crowd is packing densely around about her and nobody can see what she's doing and she gets down and she puts her faith into action. She stretches out her hand and I'm not sure if she just touched it or grabbed hold of it, but she touches the border of the garment of the Lord Jesus. What she was doing was this. She was putting her faith into action. Now, dear friend, if you're going to be saved, there are three elements to your faith. First of all, you've got to know about the Lord Jesus. Somebody had told her. I wonder who it was. I wonder how she got to hear. Was it just gossip? Or did a friend bring a message to her? We don't know. But someday, for the first time she heard about Jesus of Nazareth, what a day that was. It was going to change the rest of her life. Dear friends, the wonderful thing, the first thing, if we're going to be saved and be forgiven, the first thing is to hear about Jesus of Nazareth, to hear the story of the Savior. That's why we preach the gospel. It's because we need to know about the Savior. We need to know that he came from heaven. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead. He's able to save all who trust in him. That's the great message. And all over the world tonight, and all over the world uh, every day, I suppose, people are telling this message because that's the first element of faith. The Bible says faith comes from hearing, and hearing from the Word of God. And the first thing she heard about Jesus. But then the second element of her faith, and, and we need this as well. She not only heard the story, she believed the story. She believed it was true. There are people who know all about the Lord Jesus and just think it's a myth. They just don't believe it actually happened. But it may well be, I'm talking to somebody tonight and you've heard the story. And you believe the story. You believe the Bible. You believe it's true. But you're still not saved. You're still not forgiven. You're still not blessed. Because once she heard and she believed it was true, she had to act on her belief and she had to make it hers personally by contacting the Savior, by coming in contact with him and actively by a, a definite act of her will by making contact with the Lord Jesus. Well, dear friends, if you know about him and if you believe it's true, You've got to believe it's true. And if you believe it's true, then you need simply to turn to him by a definite act of repentance and faith and put your trust in the Lord Jesus. There's a strange idea 
that has raised its head. I've just discovered this quite recently in uh, our modern society. And it's an old, old idea. It's an old error. And it's this idea that because Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, then he has automatically saved everyone, that every human being, whether they believe or not, whether they repent or not, whether they're converted or not, whether they come to him or not, every single human being is automatically saved. People think that. Dear friend, that is emphatically not what the Bible teaches. God is waiting for your response. If you do nothing, you'll be lost. If you want to be saved, you've got to act, and you've got to act now. You've got to come. You've got to believe. You've got to repent. You've got to reach out your hand. You've got to contact Christ. You've got to receive him. And so this woman's faith, it was reasonable, it was personal, and it was an act of faith. And finally, as my time is gone, I just want to come to this last point. It was a public faith. This woman wanted to keep it private. We can tell that. Perhaps she was a shy, introverted, uh, retiring kind of lady. And the Bible says that when she touched the Lord Jesus, she knew. And the wonderful thing is, did you notice this in the reading, that she knew and he knew. Immediately, they knew that something had happened. And dear friends, the moment someone trusts in the Lord Jesus, they know it and he knows it. And I can imagine the woman, there's a, there's a leap of joy in her heart as she realizes that immediately her problem is solved and she can feel it, she knows it. And she's turning just to, to, to sneak out of the crowd. Her heart is beating, and she's just desperate to get home, and she's going to rejoice about it in private, and she doesn't want anyone to know about it, and she thinks she'll just steal away. And she's just so excited about it, but she wants to get away. She doesn't want to make a scene. But the Lord Jesus stops. And, of course, when Jesus stops, the crowd stops, and everyone stops. And why are we stopping? What's wrong? And he turns around. Who touched my clothes? What a question. What a question. The disciples couldn't understand it. Why? People are against, they're jostling you, oppressing against you. Everyone's touching you. The Lord Jesus says, I perceive that somebody's touched me. Virtue, power has gone out from me. And he looks round about. He knew who it was. Now, let's be clear about this. The Lord Jesus didn't want to embarrass this lady. He didn't want simply to make some kind of scene. And, 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 and to bring her out into the public gaze. But he did want to make her faith a public matter. And there were two reasons for that. The first reason was this, that he knew that she would not have the assurance and the peace of his blessing until she made a public confession. And so here she is, and she's fearing and trembling. She's nervous, but she comes. She can't be hid. She knows that he, he's looking at her. And uh, she turns around, and she falls down at his feet, and she tells the whole story. And it's only when she makes a public confession, the Lord Jesus says to her, your faith has saved you. Go into peace. And she has the assurance, and she has got a lightness. It was for her benefit to make a public confession. Dear friend, maybe there's somebody listening to this and you are a secret believer in the Lord Jesus. You've trusted him, all right, and you know you have, but you've never told anyone. You've kept it private. You don't want to make it public. I'll tell you this, you will never have the full assurance and the peace and joy of salvation until you make it public, until you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. And the second reason was this, the Lord Jesus wanted it to be a blessing to other people too. The interesting thing is, up to this point, we don't read of anyone else touching the Lord Jesus like this. But after this point, we do read about it. And so it seems that people have heard the news. This story has got around. And people say, you can contact him like this. And this is what this lady did. And others said, well, I'll do that too. And so you read after this of others who touched the Lord Jesus, who touched his clothes and were healed. She was the first to do it. And the Lord Jesus wanted her to publicly confess him so that others would be blessed. Maybe somebody listening to this and in your heart you're a believer and you've trusted Christ and you're relying upon him, but you've never told the soul. If you want true assurance and peace, you must come out and confess Jesus as Lord and the joy that will fill your heart. In fact, that's one of the reasons for Christian baptism. In the early days when people heard the gospel message and believed in the Lord Jesus, immediately they were baptized to display and to publicly confess the faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it brought and it brings peace and joy to take that step and to publicly say, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus. And your testimony, your witness can be a great blessing to others as well. Well, I enjoy this message. I enjoy it myself. I, I love this incident. There's so much we can learn from it. Remember this. It wasn't simply the touch. It was the faith that was expressed in the touch. And it was a reasonable faith. It was a personal faith. It was an act of faith. It was a faith that was made public. He's on his way to bless others. I can be sure of this. Somebody's going to be saved tonight somewhere. He can bless you while he's on the way to bless them. He can bless you. The opportunity is yours. You can reach out, as it were, by faith. You can make contact with the Lord Jesus, turn to him, believe in him, receive him, and be saved. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee that there was no case too hard for him. We thank thee that the same is true today. No one has ever come to the Savior in faith and found that he was a disappointment. We pray that somebody listening might reach out their hand in faith and make contact with the Lord Jesus and trust him and know in their heart and be able to come out with a public confession of faith and have the assurance and the peace of salvation. We pray for thy blessing in the Lord's name. Amen.